classic old-time radio all day long. This is Old Time Radio USA. Speeding from coast to coast, the Federal Express thunders through the night. Adventures, thrills, romance. Ride the rails with Ned Jordan, Secret Agent. Under guise of settling labor and accident claims for the Consolidated American Railroad, Ned Jordan secretly investigates the activities of foreign agents and other federal enemies. Missions known only to J.B. Medwick, president of the railroad. Government authorities act on the information gathered by Jordan, who steps quietly out of the picture. The Federal Express slowed down for a station, and an attractive young woman prepared to leave the train. She opened the door of her compartment. Pardon me, just a moment, Miss Waterbury. I don't know you. The name is Proctor, Federal Department. What? There's a matter that we'd like to speak to you about. We'll stay right on the train until the next stop. Is this an arrest? Well, that's entirely up to you. If you'll come quietly and willingly, it won't be considered as an arrest yet. You have no warrant. But I have, you see. Now, will you go back into your stateroom quietly? address Waterbury carried, and here's the letter she was sent. It tells her to show the letter to the man who orders lentil soup. Lentil soup. Very well, Inspector Proctor. I'll, I'll do my best. And, well, be careful, Judy. If Jordan or your father knew that you were in on this, they'd have my scalp. I'll be careful. And when I do tell Ned, I'll lead him to believe it was nothing but coincidence that took me to that funny little restaurant. Mind if I sit here? It is the only available table. What difference would it make if I minded? It is unusual to find one of your type in in a place like this. Is it? Unless, of course, you have some specific reason for coming here. I've heard that they have exceptionally good soup. Soup? Yes. Your order? I will have the lentil soup. Very well. Do you know many people here? I believe I have friends around here. Good, and so have I. That should perhaps make us friends, eh? I'm sorry, but... You perhaps are a friend of Margot, the cashier and waitress. And if I am? You might have a letter to her, or perhaps from her. I do happen to have a letter, but I couldn't show it to anyone unless I were certain that they, too, are a friend. Good. <laughs> so you are cautious. That is the best way. In his business, one cannot take chances. Hardly. But you will uh, recognize perhaps a sign, huh? Like uh, this. And you, in turn, would recognize a letter like this? Oh. I'm advised that everything I need to know will be told me here. You have heard of Karnak? Karnak? Isn't that an assumed name? So you also know that. That is good. Tomorrow is to be the day. The day? The foreign representative who uses the name of Karnak arrives tomorrow on the Federal Express. Those of us who live in the city have been instructed. I don't live in the city. I know. So now I tell you that tonight is the meeting. Where? You will be here at eight. Is the meeting to be here? You will at that time be advised where the meeting is held. The priestess of true light is eager that all should be on hand. Very well. Tomorrow is one of the biggest days in our true light call. With the arrival of Karnak. Tell me this. How did you know that he was traveling under that name? We know much. Each day we gain new strength. So it would seem. You would be surprised at some of the things we have already learned and done. In two assassinations, we have been successful. Tomorrow, when Karnak arrives to meet his end, it will be a great stroke for us. One that may have unlimited possibilities. Just what will Karnak's, the man who is called Karnak, what will his death accomplish? You know the conditions in the old country now? Yes, of course. It takes but little to start new trouble. Yes, but Karnak... His death may allow sympathies for our people. They will resent his death in America. Perhaps indemnities will be demanded. Apologies which the United States cannot and will not give. Perhaps the war will come. 
And then we shall have powerful nations in sympathy with us. I see. First the death, and then the propaganda that we follow. How many do you expect to attend the meeting tonight? At the very least, there will be 50 of us. All members of the true light. The true light. Is it not glorious? We shall someday rule the world. <laughs> Take me to the Consolidated American Railroad Building and hurry. So after this guy started talking to you, you realized you might be on the track or something and kidded him along, huh? That's right, Ned. There will be 50 people at this meeting. But if this organization is so terribly secret... Why'd this bird start telling you so much? I told you, he was expecting someone else and mistook me for her. So when the woman he's waiting for arrives, he'll know he made a mistake. You shouldn't go to places like that. All right, I shouldn't, but I did. How did I know it was a hangout for the true light cult? <laughs> we won't worry too much about the true light. Fifty crackpots can't overthrow America, you know. The police wouldn't like it. All right, treat it lightly, then. I'll report the thing to the police and let them send a couple of men to attend the meeting. You'd better wait and hear what else I have to say. Well? And then, if you think my contact with that outfit can't be used, I'll retire to a dark corner and stand with my face to the wall. Yeah? <laughs> Go ahead, Judy. I didn't tell you who they're planning to murder. No. A guy's traveling under the name of Karnak. What? You knocked over your chair. Karnak. You shouldn't do that, Ned. It's hard on the office furniture. How do they know about Karnak? Federal Express has kept his travel one of the deep, dark secrets. Mm hmm. And he's using an assumed name and traveling under the watchful eye of Merkel of the Federal Department. But the true lighters are planning his assassination. What does that make me? A valued ally or a fool dame that stuck her chin out too far? Oh, but, Judy, the way he's being guarded, it'd be suicide for anyone to try and reach him. Sure, so what? You think fanatics like these people care about their own lives? Not a bit. They're glad of the chance to serve what they think is their patriotic cause by dying for a purpose. You know who Karnak is? Sure, he's coming from Europe to discuss important deals in war supplies. And he has blue and royal blood in his veins. Exactly. It's worth the future of the railroad to move him safely and secretly. What else do you know? Well, holding the hands like this is a sign of recognition these true light people use. And Margot, cashier at this restaurant, is one of them. She gave the man I talked to the name of Callio. Callio. I'll see if he's known to the federal men. And the woman in charge of the local True Light members is called a high priestess. Mm. One of those fanatic outfits. What a dangerous one. Especially to the Federal Express if they carry out their murder plan. Judy, you sit tight and say nothing. I've got to get hold of Proctor or Merkel on the phone. Merkel's aboard the Federal Express with Karnak. I know. What can we do, though? You can't go to that meeting tonight. And on the other hand, we've got to learn the plan of these cultists if we're to protect Karnak. Jordan, may I come in? Oh, sure, Proctor. Just the guy I'm thinking about. Yeah? Judith ran into something big. Yeah, I know. You know. We made an arrest, Jordan. A woman named Waterbury. Real name, Koskiensky. And? She was on her way to a meeting of the True Light Cult. Well, we detained her. And Judy went in her place. Double crosser. What? I'm sorry, fellow, but we were really desperate. We had to have a girl that resembled Waterbury, and I asked Judy to help us out. So that's it. All right, it was in the, in the interest of the railroad. Karnak is coming here on the Federal Express tomorrow, isn't he? Yes. One of the main purposes of his visit is to discuss matters with Medwick. If he's murdered in Medwick's home or office, it'll be a fine state of international affairs. All right, Proctor. You know about the cult, and you sent Judy to sound out the people in the restaurant. But she is not going to the meeting tonight. No, I agree with you. She isn't. Let me go. I can learn a lot more there. They're going to discuss the plans for this this assassination. Not a chance. These cultists are crackpots, and they have some mighty fantastic notions. But, Jordan, they're dangerous. Well? And they're clever. If they weren't pretty shrewd, they'd never have kept their word quiet as long as they have. What do you want of me, then? What's your idea? For the present, we'll have to abandon any hope of making arrests there and confine ourselves to guarding the man named Karnak. Okay. Now, it's up to you to pull the necessary strings and have the schedule changed around a bit. In short, shunt the Federal Express into a siding for half an hour before it gets to the city and bring some other train in in place of it. I think that can be arranged. I'll speak to Mr. Medwick about it right away. We'll have, uh... 
one of our men disguised to resemble Karnak in the same relative stateroom on the train. And have him get killed? Oh, we'll give him all the protection we can. He, uh, he's willing to take the chance. And what if these murderers get him? Well, Sailor Gare. That's the sort of chance we take all the time. If they do attempt to get him, you'll be able to arrest him. Is that it? Yeah. And you'll get the one or two who make the murder attempt. You'll try to make them talk, and they won't talk. And the rest of these misguided fools will keep right on with their plans. Well? If you'll send me to that meeting tonight, you may get evidence against all of them. No, Miss Medwick. We can't let you do it. But why? I'm in with them now. I can be guarded by you men. No. If you keep insisting, I'll have your father take a hand. You'll see what you can do about those schedules? Yeah, right away. And let me know. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'll wait to hear from you. Ned, you can't let Proctor get away with it. You can't, do you hear me? Now, hold on. You'd sooner let him get killed than let me take the slightest risk. Proctor? Yes, of course. He's the one who's going to impersonate Karnak. How do you know? Because he's the master of disguise. He's the one that always does that sort of thing. You can't let him make a target of himself tomorrow. Oh, but Judy... I can go to that meeting tonight, and you can tell Proctor I've gone. He wouldn't stand for it. But he needn't know until after I've gotten there. Just tell him I've gone, and then you couldn't stop me. You can get men to surround the building. They can follow if we leave there and be ready at the first sign of trouble. Your father wouldn't stand for it a minute, and you know it. Dad needn't know. Do you think I'm entirely helpless, Ned? I'm not quite the fool you make me out to be. I realize the type of people these cultists are. If anything happened to you, Judy... There's less chance of that than in what might happen to Proctor tomorrow. How do you suppose I'd feel if he were to be murdered? Knowing that if I'd gone to that meeting, I'd know the time and place and plan of the murder and been able to forestall it. I tell you, Ned Jordan, you've got to agree to let me go there. Judy, there's no use arguing. All they'll do is discuss the plan for killing Karnak. They'll designate the one who's to do it. And if we just know who it is, think how simple it would be to have him surrounded by federal men when the train pulls in. They set up a plan to lure Karnak to some other place. I'll learn about that. They think I'm the Waterbury woman. Don't you see? They won't harm me. Wait a minute. It's Proctor's life, Ned. Can't you understand that? Yes, yes, I know. Now, let me think. Let me try it. I wonder. The real Waterbury woman is in custody, isn't she? Yes, and there's no chance of her getting loose to tell Callio and Margo and the others that I'm an imposter. Judy, sit down. Well? I want you to tell everything you know about this cult. Don't leave out a thing. Tell all you know. And then, perhaps... Perhaps what? Perhaps you can go to that meeting tonight. Early that evening, a guard approached the cell in which the Waterbury woman was held. Miss Waterbury. Well, now what? Some more questioning? So you might as well save your time and breath. I have nothing to say. You're free. What? Yeah, someone with influence came around with a writ. Well, isn't that something? It certainly is. What about my property? Stop at the desk on your way out. How to sue you for false arrest. Maybe I will before I'm finished. That's up to you. It's nothing to us. We're just local cops. It was a federal that made the complaint. All we did was hold you as he requested. We'll see if there's any justice around this country. I know my constitutional rights. Right in here, please. This is where I get my handbag and the things from my pocket. Sign right here, please. I'll sign all right. And you haven't heard the last of this. If I were you, miss, I'd sort of let things stay as they are. You stir up a lot of trouble and you might find yourself in the middle of it. Is that a threat? Oh, no, no. Don't get that idea. There you are. There's your things. Count my money. Make sure that's all here. The fellow who delivered the writ is waiting at the curb. Oh, Thanks. Oh, the air's good after that. Waterbury. Oh, yes? Over here. Who are you? The name is Bushing, Miss Waterbury. I doubt if it would mean much to you. I never heard the name before. When you were apprehended on a train, it became known at once. The only reason you were held was to make it possible for another woman to replace you in calling on Carly and Margo. Who are they? Agents of the priestess. Oh. And you? The scout who saw what happened to you contacted the home office, which in turn communicated with me to effect your immediate release. Please get in. We are already late. Late? For what? For the meeting, you fool. At eight, it is to be started. And there is an imposter there, a spy for the federal government. Then drive. <laughs> Eight 
your cloth, Ned. All right, Judy. Go to that restaurant, then. And be careful. I will be. Please don't worry. I wish I didn't have to. Everything will work out all right. How are you at his eight o'clock? Uh, we locked the door. Uh, it is Waterbury. Let her in. I was afraid she wasn't coming. Come, come. You're almost late. Just eight, isn't it? The priest insists that we be prompt. Alonso, you come stand guard at the door. I was to be told where the meeting is. Is it here? It is here. Here? The basement. You follow me. Very well. Coming, Margot. Coming. Down here. That is right. Is there another way to get in or out of this place? No. Well, aren't you afraid of being trapped here? We take precautions. But what would you do if you were found out? Why? Well, the Eastern office will be interested in knowing when I bring back my report. We will not be found out. The doors are well guarded. We suppress all that might conceivably be used as evidence against us. Nothing is written. I see. Here now, the next door. You see? No window so light can shine out. And sound proof so nothing can be heard when we celebrate a great victory. Or punish an offender. The meeting will open now. Your robe is waiting, Margot. Yes. You are the princess. Quiet now. Quiet. Comrades. We convene tonight to plan for that event which tomorrow night shall be celebrated. You have been brought here to be informed of the plans when Karnak arrives. Cooperation on the part of all of you will be required. One among you will be appointed or otherwise chosen to do the actual deed. The others shall surround that one and forestall to the fullest extent the efforts of any who try to hold him after the shot has been fired. As to the fine points of the plan, we first shall select the one who is to do the killing. You all know the reward for doing such an act. The highest of honors to your name if you are captured and punished by law. If you escape, $5,000 in cash and a three months leave of absence in which to enjoy the wealth. Tonight, I do not ask for volunteers. Quiet, please. I am going to ask you to draw a bean from the hat. And the one who draws the black bean will be the one appointed for the task. Carlio, please stand forward. Yes. Take the hat and the bean. The rest of you may converse softly while the drawing is being done. Carlio, I want you to see to it that the new girl, Waterbury, is the one who gets the black bean. But why her? She is unproved. But her record in the East. As far as we are concerned, she is unproved. Let her get the appointment with murder. Very well. As you come on. Please, your turn to draw. Very well. Oh, white. Oh, I could use the money into vacation. Ah, a white bean. When one draws the black bean, please declare yourself, and there will be no need to continue. There is but one black bean. Why? Your turn. You want me to draw? Yes. The black. Black. It is over. The black has been drawn. By whom? Waterbury. My congratulations. Please stand beside me. Very well. Our comrade who has just been transferred to this branch is honored with the great task of tomorrow. In her hand rests our hope of victory. <laughs> comrade, you will remain here in these rooms until the time of the appointment tomorrow. You will have no communication with the outside until you leave with your guard to go to the station. I need not advise you of penalties, need I? What penalties? There will be four men with you each of whom will be armed with knives and guns. The guns are to defend you after you have fired the death shot. And the knives, you know what they are for? What? They will be used on you if that shot is fired carelessly or not fired at all. Four friends will be close to you. And in the crowd, the knife... Uh... <laughs> 
No, there is no misunderstanding, is there? No, there is none. And one thing further. Yes? It is possible you may find this task distasteful to you. Well? If so, it would verify a vague suspicion that has for some time been in my mind. What suspicion? You have had surprisingly little to say about the Eastern office. Are you or are you not our comrade Waterbury? Whatever gave you the impression, I was not. I do not know. But if you are not, you can well imagine what is ahead for you. Of course I can. And you think that which is ahead would be quite justified, do you not? Of course. Very well. Now we shall proceed with the meeting. The next is... Stand by the door. There are other arrivals coming. As a the newcomer. Who are they? That woman. There she is. Please, that woman. Who are you? I'm Waterbury. That woman's an imposter. No, no, wait. There's a mistake. Don't believe her. All right, don't believe me. But listen to what Comrade Bushing has to say. Let him tell what happened to me. How I was met on the train, my credentials taken away, and how I was taken to a detention cell. Is all this true? No, no, wait. Let me explain. Close that door and guard it well. No one is to leave. Let go of me. You're hurting my arm. We should break those arms if what has been said is true. We'll do more than that. Yes, is a real comrade. You have my word for it. She can give all the passwords. She can recite every detail of what has gone before. That woman is marked for death. No, no, I... Please, please don't kill me. It is a splendid time to try the new silent gun. The air gun. The gun which will be used tomorrow for Karnak. Wait, wait. Quiet, Margot. I will take charge for the next few moments. That woman, imposter that she is, shall meet her punishment before you are. No! Yeah! I would say the gun has proved successful. But you, who are you? He's a representative from the Home Office who affected my release from prison. In time to check that federal spy. That, that girl? A federal agent? I'm smart enough, Collie. You're the fool all of you. But now, if it is not, she came here. What about this murder? How do we account for it? We must dispose you of it. You needn't worry about that, Calio. I'll attend to the disposition. I have the necessary contacts. You have the necessary... Enough of them to get me out of prison. One moment. You say you are the real Waterbury. Yes. Then tell me, why are you through life? To bring knowledge and enlightenment to all the world and make a brotherly understanding that will make no man his brother's master. You know... One more. I say seek. I say life. Together we are seeking life. The true life. I am satisfied. Oh, how stupid fool you are. You were taken in by that spy. But, but Margot, she had the letters. Stolen from me. All right, Margot. Now I take the stand. But you... What? I take the stand to introduce the new air gun, which has but recently been put at our disposal. I also bring good news. Let Bushing take the stand. He showed us the spy. All right. Thank you. Comrades, a high honor awaits one of you assembled here tonight. The one who is finally designated for the uh, appointment with Karnak tomorrow is to be given greater than ever rewards. What are they? That comrade is to return to the East with me to take over one of the highest offices in our international true light brotherhood. This, in addition to the cash bonus. Wait, wait, wait. Before we get... You stand back there. I was only going to make sure this fire was there. Now to see... Stand back and listen when I'm speaking. Uh, I'm sorry. As I was about to say, before we designate who shall be honored, we must seek light and knowledge. And that is why I am here. I select the one for the high office in the East. Then let that man or woman prove his or her worth by killing Karnak. How do you plan to make this selection? By asking each applicant what he or she has done for us in the past. I helped in the assassination of the... I sabotaged that aircraft plant as a warning. Wait, wait, wait. I cannot hear all of you at once. Let the priestess declare an intermission while each of you writes out his claims. Then let me consider these in turn. Is that agreeable? Yes. Put our act into writing. Is there anyone here whom you do not trust? How else am I to decide who is to be taken east? Very well. Declare the intermission. You have heard what our leader says. Act on his command. <laughs> Knowing 
that high honor awaited the member of the cult who was chosen by Bushing, the comrades itemized every claim that they could think of on the sheets of paper. And there was another incentive. Why, with that new air gun, it will be almost certain that the important one will escape unharmed. I must ask you to finish this quickly as possible. While Judith Medwick still lay on the floor, Bushing kept a sharp eye on his watch. And as the hands approached 9.30, he called for the papers. Bring them to me. Have you all signed your name? Yes, yes. I will need some time to look these over. And when we have made the selection, we will hand the papers to your priestess, Margot, to be burnt. So there will be no evidence against you. That is important. While I am studying these papers, I am going to present another new development that is now at our disposal and that you have the chance to examine it. Here, these two small pear-shaped containers. Be careful of them. They break easily. What are they? He showed them to me on the way here. They're the newest of gas shells. Gas contained in these is exceptionally virulent. So please handle them with the utmost caution while I check your applications for promotion. Here, Margot, you may look first. At look out! Careful! Not, not, not I, you fool, you clumsy fool! My eyes! My eyes! Yes. Get out! Get out of here and hurry! A deep breath of that means death! You need a trick! Run, open the door! Let me out of here! Let me out! <laughs> Smoke filling the basement room without windows, the members of the cult raced up the stairs and through the restaurant, disregarding the all important papers they'd left behind. Out of my way! The gas comes up the stairs! Harry, let me out of here! Front door is here! Bushing acted quickly. He snatched goggles and nose plugs from a pocket and clamped them over the face of Judy, who was still on the floor. Then he produced another outfit and protected himself against the gas. Calio turned. Oh, you broke my That girl is not dead. Why do you protect her? There's another bomb for you, Calio! that rang out was not the one that Bushing had been using. It was the voice of Proctor of the Federal Department. Screams and shouts of pain and fear filled the restaurant. The front door burst open and men lined a path from the door across the sidewalk to the police wagons that were waiting at the curb. There they come, boys. Heard of it. Police, what is this? In with you and make it fast. All right, so lucky against me. Constitutional right. By this time, we've got confessions of everything you've done, signed by each of you. Get in those wagons. This is an arrest. Uncle Sam wants you. Some more coffee, Inspector Proctor? Coffee? I never refuse that, Miss Medwick. This is a pretty modest celebration in view of everything. Proctor doesn't have to put his life on the chopping block tomorrow. Karnak will not be attacked, and Uncle Sam has made a nice house cleaning of at least one nest of rats. Oh, Jordan, that idea of yours was a honey. Nonsense. The idea was nothing. It took working out. And you and Judy certainly did that. Yeah, but how did you know it would work out that way? Well, you first won the confidence of the Waterbury girl by getting her out of jail. Then by showing her the air gun and the gas bomb. Sure, and then she carried me through the rest of the way. The make-believe shooting of Judy with a capsule of red ink to leave a smear got you into the confidence of that gang. And the offer of a big promotion took you right into their greedy hearts. After that, it was a natural. Yeah, but you, Jordan, had it all reasoned out that the bunch would react just as they did. They couldn't react any other way, Proctor. It was fundamental psychology. <laughs> okay, Jordan. And say, Ju uh, Miss Medwick, you'd better skip that coffee. You don't want it? Uh, I'd better clear out. But why? Well, you and Jordan here, the two of you. Moonlight and roses and a third party. <laughs> I'm getting out. And that's just fundamental psychology. <laughs> and anyway, I want to watch the midnight train taking that pack of crackpots out of the city. That's worth watching.
just heard the adventure of the True Light Cult. These exciting dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit and are sent to you each Tuesday night at this same time. They are copyrighted features of Ned Jordan, Secret Agent Incorporated. All characters, names, places, and incidents used in this drama are purely fictitious. Bob Height speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Established in 1999, you're listening to the oldest streaming old-time radio station on the internet today. You're listening to Old Time Radio USA. Of man's estates, there is one apart from the rest. The fourth estate. Starring Mark Hellinger in The Fourth Estate, a dramatization of the outstanding accomplishments of the American press. His guest tonight, film star Edmund O'Brien. The story, The Tip-Off. True fact, edited and reported by that master storyteller, veteran newsman, and motion picture producer, Mr. Mark Hellinger. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mark Hellinger, speaking in tribute to the newspaper men and women of the Fourth Estate, those hard-hitting guys and gals of the nation's working press. On the Fourth Estate, you will hear their behind-the-scenes stories, strange human dramas as varied as life itself. Tonight, the Los Angeles Examiner has opened its confidential files so that we might bring you a true tale of an Examiner reporter, Jack Adams, who joined a tough gang of criminals in order to get his story. Later on, you're going to meet Jack in person. But before getting into his story, let's not forget that this week, on papers all over the country, other history-making stories are being written, a number of them deserving of far more than passing recognition. And here are several that have been acclaimed by editor and publisher, recognized authority of the newspaper world as the week's best. So let's tip our hats to... The Antelope Valley Ledger Gazette. For its two-fisted editorial courage in starting the investigation which resulted in this week's expose of the Ku Klux Klan in California. The Morning Bulletin of Wade, Arkansas. For their smashing series of front-page appeals which resulted in finding a home for every veteran retained to date. The Chicago Sun. For Mel Durslag's human interest story on the seeing-eyed dog in the La Salle Hotel fire that led a 23-year-old blind girl down 11 flights of fire escape to safety. And with that brief cross-section of the best in the week's press, we come to our story of the week, The Tip-Off, starring Edmund O'Brien in the role of Jack Adams. You meet some pretty strange people in the newspaper game. Especially those crackpots who are constantly turning up around the city room with fantastic tales they insist are true and must be printed in the next edition. On rare occasions, they have something that's really hot. Like this character who showed up one afternoon at the Los Angeles Examiner and tried to get in to see the editor. He was a little guy with an odd habit of twisting his head as though he were giving himself a chiropractic treatment. You could tell from the way he kept glancing around that he was pretty scared, and his voice was thin and wheezy when he talked. The kind of voice that's usually a dead giveaway for an ex-convict. Jack Adams, one of the reporters on the examiner, was just returning to the office from an assignment when the fellow buttonholed him in the lobby. Hey! Hey, mister! Yes? Uh, you work here? Yes, why? I'd like to see the editor. Well, he's a busy guy right now. What do you want to see him about? I'd like to inquire about unloading a certain piece of information. I'm sorry, but we don't buy stories, if that's what you mean. Well, this would be more like in the nature of a reward, you might say. What kind of information does it involve? It involves, uh, you might say, uh, some parties, uh, which are friends of mine, uh, who are shoving queer. Shoving queer? Oh, oh. Oh, you mean passing counterfeit money? You might say. Phony hairs. 
Have you told the police the story? Nah. I couldn't tell them on account of Bud and Charlie might think it was me what squeal. And of course it wouldn't be. Of course not. I don't do no business with cops. Look, by the way, what's your name? Blackie. No, no, your real name. Oh. <laughs> uh, Smith. Only uh, call me Blackie. Well, look, Blackie, if these boys are friends of yours, how come you're so anxious to turn them in? They didn't have no right mixing up business and dames, did they? What dame? My dame, Virginia. Well, we used to be sort of... Well, you know, uh, well, only it ain't that way no more now. Now, look, we're not interested. But this guy, Charlie, thinks all he got to do is flash a bunch of phony dough in front of her face, and that's all it takes. Well, I don't stand for that kind of stuff, see? So I'd like to see the edit. Well, supposing your story is on the up and up, we couldn't touch it just on your say-so. Unless, of course, one of our own reporters could check on the facts. How do you mean? Well, one of our reporters would have to meet these men you speak of and perhaps see some of this counterfeit being made. I don't imagine that would be possible, would it? It could be arranged. It could? Sure. How? Well, uh, I'd have to introduce you first to their regular steer man, a guy named Moxie. And then what? Well, uh, say, for instance, uh, you're a pal of mine, see? You like to make a buy of some of the stuff. Maybe take over territory. You understand? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. What would happen if your friends didn't? How are you going to know? You don't look no different from other guys I brung up. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'll see what my editor thinks of the idea. Um, when would be a good time to meet this Moxie if we decide to go through with it? Tonight's as good as any. Any time after seven. Well, let's leave it this way. I'll meet you here in the lobby at seven o'clock. Oh, uh, my name is Jack Adams. Okay, Mr. Adams. Oh, uh, and... Uh, about the reward. Well, if there's a reward, I'll see that the Treasury Department learns where the tip came from. Of course, the boys might not like it so good if they found out about you. No, Blackie. That might make things a little rough for the both of us. Our star, Edmund O'Brien, will return to our fourth estate microphone in just a moment. But now, here is Gain Whitman. And here is the spot reserved for your first sales message. But we're holding up a deadline, so let's return to our editor, Mark Hellinger. Our story continues, telling of a dangerous counterfeit ring and the part played by a Los Angeles reporter, Jack Adams, in exposing their activities. A member of the gang, known as Blackie, had made contact with Adams at the newspaper and promised to lead him to the counterfeiters. After getting a green light on the story from Jim Richardson, his city editor, Adams made a phone call, and shortly before Blackie was due to arrive, a couple of men showed up at the city room. Your name, Adams? Yes. I'm Graham, Treasury Department Secret Service. How are you? Now, this is Frank Conway, my partner. Hello. Glad to know you, sir. Hey, pull up some chairs for us. Uh, the uh, agent in charge said that you telephoned about a counterfeit contact, Mr. Adams. Yes, a fellow who calls himself Blackie. He promised to introduce me to a gang who are making phony half dollars. Now, does that sound like anything? It might. Los Angeles has been flooded with counterfeit halves for over three months now. We haven't been able to make a single arrest. Uh, you see, Mr. Adams, uh, whoever's making this counterfeit is an expert. It's almost impossible to tell it from the real thing. I thought it was pretty easy to tell a counterfeit coin by the ring of the metal. Well, that's just it. These bogus coins have almost the same ring as the genuine. Oh. Yes, a pretty smooth copy. Uh -huh. But there still are ways to recognize the counterfeit. For one thing, they're lighter than the real thing and also a trifle greasy to the touch. I see. Well, it's almost 7 o'clock. I'd better get down to the lobby. This guy Blackie's due here any minute, and he's liable to get anxious if I'm not there. Right. You'd better meet him just as you plan. Wherever you go, we'll be around somewhere. But don't recognize us. And uh, you think you can get away with it? I think so. I've put on the oldest suit I could find, and I once did a story on sideshows. I'm hoping I can remember enough Connie talk to sound like one of the boys. <laughs> okay. And good luck, Adams. And remember... No matter how rough the play gets, you're on your own. I'll 
This here's the place, Mr. Adams. Some dive. But you want to watch that Mr. stuff, Blackie. Slip like that inside and we'll both be dead pigeons. Better call me Jack. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, Jack. Okay, Blackie, it's your party. Let's go in. Hiya, Blackie. Where you been keeping yourself? I've been around. Yeah? What happened to Virginia? Uh, she's been sort of working on a new job. Yeah? I uh, say, babe, uh, see anything of Moxie tonight? Sure, he's sitting over there in one of the booths. Oh, thanks. Come on, let's shove back. Uh, excuse me, babe. Sure. Yeah, yeah, here he is. Hiya, Moxie. Hello, Blackie. I thought you wasn't going to show. I'd uh, like you to meet a pal of mine, Moxie. This is Jack. Pleased to meet you. Sit down. You know, I ain't seen Jack here in quite a while. I just happened to bump into him again this afternoon. Yeah, it has been quite a hitch, Blackie. Let's see. Uh, I ain't seen you since uh, since the fair at Dago. That's right. That's when it was, the fair at Dago. And what was you doing in Dago, Pally? I'm playing a rule, same as us, Moxie. He's a right gee, I tell you. I wasn't asking you, Blackie. If it makes any difference, I used to shill on the midway. Yeah, no offense, Pally. Only sometimes Blackie opens his trap when he ain't asked. See, you found him all right, fellas. What are you going to have? Make mine a double shot. Okay. Yeah, same. Okay, coming right up. Uh, what brings you to L.A., Pally? Huh? Oh, just casing around for a way to turn a fast buck. Yeah, Moxie. Uh, Jack here tells me he's got a few hundred bucks he'd like to put to work. So I, I was thinking... You was that... thinking what? Well, maybe Bud and Charlie might yeah, be into... Fellas. That'll be 150. Yeah, take them all out of this. That's 150 out of two. Never mind, you can keep the scratch. Thanks. Uh, hey, look, baby, uh, as long as you got some change there, break this hair for me, will you? Yeah, okay, Moxie. Hey, uh... Thanks. Well, oh, what do you think, Moxie? About what? About Bud and Charlie being interested in Jack here. I don't know. Maybe they might. That is, if it's like you say it is, Blackie. But if it ain't... What's with this double talk? If you guys got a deal on it and want to chew it over alone, it's okay by me. I'm going to blow. Now, now, wait a minute, Jack. Moxie don't mean nothing. He gets a little liquor in him. He sounds off like that. Eh, nothing personal, Pally. After all, I don't know nothing about you. Okay, so Blackie says you're on the inside. You used to shill at the Dago Fair. That's what Blackie says. Well, I like to find out for myself. So I find out, and well, now we can talk business. Only not here. Okay. Let's duck this joint. Where do you want to go? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe we could take them up right now to meet Bud and Charlie, huh? There you go, shooting off your face again. You know what Bud and Charlie thinks a stranger's nosing around their setup? Or is it maybe Virginia you're interested in seeing? After what she done to me? Okay, forget it. We're gonna have a confab. We better go up to my hotel. We can pick up a pint on the way. Why don't I just buy one now? They'll sell me a bottle at the bar, won't they? Hey, sure, sure. You got enough bucks, they'll sell you the joint. Now, you see, Moxie, you've got that guy all wrong. Yeah, maybe. Hey, Jack, you better make that a couple of pints. <laughs> Come on, come on, answer. Treasury Department, Secret Service. This is Conway. Give me the agent in charge. Stand by. Yes? This is Conway, Chief. How does it look? Red hot. Adams is with one of the gang and Graham's telling him. Anyone we know? And how? A pretty rough baby. Well, stick close and do your best. We're going to need help, Chief. Okay, I'll get him out at once. Fifth and Town Street. I'll be on the corner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Take this last shot of mine if you want. Yeah, don't mind if I do. <coughs> now, uh, about that dough deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Blackie here says you got some bucks you like to put down on a good thing. Yeah, that's what he tells me, Moxie. 500 clams. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking for a setup, but it's got to be sure and it's got to be fast, or I'm not interested. Uh, 
You happen to notice the half a buck I give the dame to change back in the bar? No, not especially. Well, take a look at this one. Take a good look. What about it? What about it, he says. <laughs> How do you like that, Roxy? <laughs> <laughs> well, Pally, it just so happens it's a phony. Yeah? Yeah. And so is the other one. <laughs> well, you sure could have fooled me. Yeah. Try dropping it on the table. Go on. Sounds like the genuine McCoy. Uh, take it from me, Pally. You're dead wrong. Here. Pick it up and rub your fingers over it. Feel how slick it is? Yeah. Yeah, like the metal is just a little greasy. Uh-huh. And it's the only giveaway. And you gotta know what you're looking for to spot that. That's a sure thing, Pally, and you can buy them from us for half what the government charges. Sure. You see how easy it is? Why, why even a baby can pass. Okay, but how do I know you can deliver? Uh, you just give us the dough and me and Blackie will give you as many as you want. All wrapped up in rolls, just like they came from the bank. Oh, no, nothing doing. When I turn over my door to make a buy, I like to see what I'm getting. I like to see what the setup is all the way, in case I want some more. Sure, Moxie. The guy's putting up the dough, he's got a right to me, Bud and Charlie. But they don't like to handle it that way, I tell you. Look, what do you take me for? Either I case the setup or we don't operate. That's it. Yeah. Okay, Pally, don't get sore. We'll take a little ride. Let's see Bud and Charlie. Hey, Bud. Charlie, open up. Who is it? It's me, Moxie. Just a minute. All right, come on. Hey, just a minute. What is this? I thought you were alone. It's just Blackie and a pal of his. Yeah, Charlie's a pal of mine. Close that door, you fool. Oh, hello, Virginia. What's the big idea, Blackie? Didn't Charlie tell you never to show up around here? What right do you got coming here anyhow? You shouldn't ought to talk that way, Virginia. I didn't come to see you. Moxie, me got business here with Charlie. Yeah, I can imagine any business you might have. You never had hold of more than two bits at one time in your life, and that you had a bum off of me. Oh, you shouldn't ought to talk that way, Virginia. Look, Charlie, this is on the level. Blackie's friend, he's got a chunk of dough, and he'd like to make a buy. Keep your mouth shut, Moxie, you're drunk again. Didn't I tell you never to come here when you were drunk? I don't like it. And I don't like strangers. Now, what do you want to do that for? What are you slapping me around for? Jack, here's a right D. He, he's an old carny friend of Blackie's. I don't care who he is. I told you to bring nobody here. He's got 500 bucks. Ain't that reason enough? Why, you dirty Look, mister. Hmm? I didn't come here to get mixed up in any hassle. The boys brought me up to talk a little business. That is, if you're interested. Well? Okay, okay, sit down. I got no beef with you. These punks make me sore. Told Moxie to lay off the bottle and look at him. It's no good in our work. I never touch it myself. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, what's on your mind? Huh? The boys give me the pitch, and it looks okay. Only, I'm no rube. I like to do business direct. I like to know all the odds. Yeah? Such as what? Well, I don't go for any chicken feed arrangement. This thing is as good as it looks. I like to take over a territory and play it across the board. <laughs> Can they show you how easy it was to shove the stuff? Yeah, yeah. Moxie made a pass in the barn. It looked pretty simple. But I'd like to try it myself before I shell out any scratch. Why, the stuff is foolproof. All you got to do is work the classier joints, like up on Heeler Broadway, where they're used to getting paid in big change. But stay away from Main Street and places like that, because down there, anything over a dime is heavy dough, and they're apt to be a little cagey, you see? Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, how big a stock do you have on hand? Ah, uh, Enough. Come on into the kitchen. I'll show you the layout. Okay. Hey, you better come too, Blackie. I don't want any beefs out here while we're gone. Oh, sure, Charlie. Sure thing. I don't want to start nothing. I ain't short, Virginia. Yeah, yeah. I know. Now, look. Don't touch nothing, because we got a new batch cooking there on the stove. Hey, that all there is to the equipment? Just those pots and ladles? Take a look at those molds there on the table. That's the important part. They're a perfect job of engraving. Hmm. Yeah, it's such close work that Bud's ruining his eyes. Gotta wear glasses all the time, poor guy. That's why Bud went to pick up some automatic equipment. The finishing is all handwork right now. Hey, uh, 
How much of the stuff can you turn out? Plenty. There's about 150 bucks worth right there we made just tonight. Yeah. But there's a lot more in the boxes under the sink. <laughs> you see? Charlie! What's the matter? Charlie, come here, quick. Huh? Hi, right, Moxie acting up? Come here, I tell you, don't ask questions. But I... Hey, look, Virginia, I don't get it. There, out the window. Hmm? In that car by the corner, in that other car across the street. Cops. Cops! Why, you dirty, no-good stool pigeons, what kind of a frame is this? It's Blackie. I told you not to let him near the place. Get him, Moxie. Don't let him get out. No, you don't, Blackie. All right, Blackie, give. Who is this rat? I, I tell you, he's a pal of mine, Charlie. I, you gotta believe me, fellas. He, he's a connie. I used to know a dago at the fair. Now, wait a minute. What's all the beef, anyhow? Come on, come Why, on, you dirty start. scum, I remember now. When you went over to buy them bottles at the bar, you talked to somebody. I seen you. Sure, sure. A guy bumped a cigarette, so I gave him one. He's lying, Charlie. He's a cop. Look, mister, we don't stand for no double cross. Let go my collar, you this fool. This will be the last time you'll cross any money. Oh, get choking me. Open up, open up. Open up. Open up. Open up. Open up. Get cross the and I kill him. Up. See, I kill him. I don't, kill him. Charlie, don't get kill him. Me. It's the cop. Shut up. He's all right. It's not oh, worth it, Charlie. Let him go. Oh, We're trapped. Yeah, Can't honey. you see that? Open up or we'll shoot. No. No, don't shoot. We'll let you in. Stop her, somebody. Let me go. Let me go, you fool. Open up. Don't shoot. Don't! Don't! Stand where you are, everyone. Oh, okay. Huh? Okay. Okay, don't shoot. We're federal agents. You're all under arrest. Oh, take your hands off of me, cop. Hey, what's the idea? You got nothing on us. It's a dirty frame. Quiet, you or we'll use cuffs. Take him on downtown, now, boys. look, I told you you got nothing on me. Let go of me. Oh, Come on, you get out. Me, all right, I'll get you for this, Blackie. You wait and see. Outside. Come uh, on. Take your hands off me, will you? You all right, Mr. Adams? Okay, Mr. Graham. Shoot. Well, I'm glad to see you. You couldn't have picked a better time to get here. Things were getting a little on the warm side. I had an idea they might. So when you passed me that note in the bar, Conway phoned for more men. We followed you on out here. Then when the rumpus began, we figured it was time to move in. <laughs> it sure was. Well, thanks very much, Adams. From the department's point of view, this is quite a haul. Thank you, sir. From my paper's point of view, it's going to make quite a story. Thank you, Edmund O'Brien, and it did make quite a story. The next edition of the Los Angeles Examiner carried it on page one. Well, that wasn't all of the story, and in just a moment, Eddie O'Brien and I will be back with Jack Adams in person to give you an ironic twist in tonight's yarn. But now again, Gain Whitman. And here, gentlemen, is the spot reserved for your second sales message. And be sure to listen to our sales message at the conclusion of this program. But we still have a show to complete, so let's return to our guest star, Edmund O'Brien, and our editor, Mark Hellinger. Thank you, Gain Whitman. Here at our fourth estate microphone is the reporter who participated firsthand in all that rough and tumble which Edmund O'Brien just reenacted. A man who can vouch for the facts of our story and add a few more to boot. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce the real Jack Adams. Take a bow, Jack. Jack Adams, I think it's about time you met Jack Adams. This is Edmund O'Brien, who did that grand job of impersonating you tonight. Hi, Jack. Glad to know you, Ed. You make a very convincing reporter. You ought to try it sometime. Thanks, Jack, but I think I'd better stick to acting. Those counterfeiting pals of yours play a little rough to make good company. Well, they were playing for keeps, Ed. Hey, uh, tell me, Jack, did Blackie ever get that reward he was so interested in? Well, after a fashion, didn't he, Jack? Yes, but not what he expected. Because he was so involved in the deal, the Treasury Department paid him only the smallest reward possible. All the counterfeit had been in halves, as you know, and that's the way they paid him off. Fifteen dollars in halves. Thirty pieces of silver. That's right, Mark. Thirty pieces of silver. Well, Jack, it was a difficult assignment, and you handled it magnificently. You certainly did. It took a lot of nerve. Well, it just happened to go my way, I guess. Oh, I think you're being a little too modest. According to Treasury Department officials, a great public service was rendered both by you and the Los Angeles Examiner in exposing and helping convict a dangerous ring of counterfeiters who had already cost the people of Los Angeles thousands of dollars. For the part you played in a dangerous game and your excellent reporting... I am proud to present to you, on behalf of my sponsor, the Fourth Estate's Gold Award of Merit, and also this check for $1,000 for your sponsor. And confidentially, Jack, it's not counterfeit. You're telling me. Thank you, Mark. 
Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure, Jack. To our way of thinking, you really earned it. Thanks for the story. Good night. Good night. And what's for next week, Mark? Next week, Ed, our fourth estate drama is a love story. Aha, uh -huh. so you jump from phony money to true love, huh? <laughs> That's a strange switch. It is, and it's a strange love story. One of the strangest that ever happened. Garnished with a sprig of mystery, I hope. In a psychological sort of way. It's a true story from the files of the Denver Post. And Jerry Bland, the cub reporter who uncovered the story, will be here to help us tell it. Sounds tolerably colossal. Well, with Ida Lupino playing the starring role, it should pack quite a dramatic wallop. As our friend Blackie would say, Ida Lupino playing any role adds up to a smart money combination. <laughs> and for once, he would have been right. So don't forget, Eddie, next week, Ida Lupino in a true story which we call Tonight is Never. You can save me two on the aisle for that, Mark. We'll certainly be listening. Check. And now this is Mark Hellinger with hat in hand saying good night and reminding you that the hard-hitting guys and gals who constitute the Fourth Estate, the nation's working press, are your watchdogs of liberty. Support a free press and keep America free. <laughs> Fourth Estate is adapted for radio by Warren Lewis, with production and direction by Homer Canfield. Music was composed and conducted by Roger Vance. Edmund O'Brien appeared tonight through the courtesy of Mark Hellinger Motion Picture Productions, where he is currently appearing in Ernest Hemingway's The Killers. Listen again next week, when Mr. Mark Hellinger brings you another true story from the confidential files of... The Fourth Estate. Broadcasting Company. That is our program. You have heard the fourth estate. But gentlemen, Mr. Hellinger has a few remarks which he would like to address to you personally. Yes, you've heard our program. But tonight's yarn was only one in a thousand. Because when dealing with newspaper stories, the variety of dramatic material is unlimited. Take these few items chosen at random. A young New Mexico reporter noticed the $25,000 stallion being delivered to former Secretary of Interior Albert Falls Ranch. His investigation resulted in the famous Teapot Dome scandal. The reporter's name was Clinton Anderson, today Secretary of Agriculture in President Truman's cabinet. What a program that would make. Another observant reporter started the investigation which uncovered the atom bomb spy accusations. Then there is the great human interest yarn about a well-known city editor, who commandeered the services of the entire city of New York in order to save the life of a two-year-old child. Add stories of arson, crooked politics, strange romance, murder. In fact, add all the cockeyed events that happen every day from the gloomy Bowery to the Golden Gate, and you'll get a rough idea of what's to be had. And when it comes to the manner in which newspapers will cooperate, well, I guess I shouldn't be saying too much along those lines. Here is Gain Whitman. He'll carry the ball for us on that topic. The Fourth Estate did not spring fully formed from the minds of its writers as their idea of something hot. Gentlemen, the building of this program and the ideas for its exploitation through newspapers are both based on research at the most primary points we could find, the city rooms themselves. The creators of the Fourth Estate walked into the offices of newspapers and press associations in Los Angeles, third largest market in the nation, and asked newspaper executives three things. One, what has kept you from giving greater editorial support to radio programs in the past? Two, what do you want in the way of a radio program? Three, if we give you such a show, will you support it in print? On the foundation stones of their answers, we constructed the fourth estate said L.D. Hotchkiss, managing editor of the Los Angeles Times. Sure, a newspaper is hard-boiled where radio is concerned. Because up till now, we've always been on the giving end. We've supplied the stories and the publicity and got nothing in return. You show me a radio program that offers my paper something of value in exchange, and we'll talk all the promotion you want. The Fourth Estate offers that value in exchange by giving national publicity to the accomplishments of individual newspapers. Said promotion manager Dave Brandman of the Los Angeles Examiner. If your fourth estate story for a particular week concerned one of the Hearst papers, we'd want to build the thing as big as possible, even as far as a news story on page one, if it should be warranted. After all, if it's handled properly, it's the same as the paper receiving an award. Right. 
for an appearance on the fourth estate would in itself be considered an award of distinction, giving a newspaper added prestige in its own community. But so much for promotion possibilities. Entertainment-wise, the variety of suspense, pathos, and humor is limitless when dealing with the strange human dramas that week after week provide grist for the mill of the fourth estate. Your favorite old-time radio shows from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. You're listening to Old Time Radio USA, part of the WOTR Radio Network. Supernatural. Supernatural. of the supernatural based on case records tales of haunters and the haunted of premonitions ghosts and clairvoyance visions telepathy tales of the unreal that happen to real people and now ladies and gentlemen our producer director Jack Johnstone good evening tell me Do you believe in ghosts, premonitions, clairvoyance, visions, telepathy? Of course not. Nor do I. Or rather, I'm not quite sure. Because history is filled with reports by people of intelligence, responsibility. People like you and me, who swear they've seen and heard things in their own homes that have sent them shrieking with terror into the night. Listen, ever hear of Jack the Ripper? Back in the year 1888, the entire city of London was terrified by a series of mutilation murders that were occurring in a section of the city known as Whitehall. And in so... How much does I owe you, Harry? (laughs) Well, Lizzie, seeing as it's you being one of the regulars, the last beer was on the house, see? (laughs) Old Harry always did have a high for a pretty lass. How much, I said? One shilling, if you please. A bob? Blimey, what does I get for at the Bank of England? Now, Lizzie, you had your drinks pie for her. What else do you think I do? I'm a lady, I'd like you to know. (laughs) There. Good night. Bit uncanny seeing you going home alone, Lizzie. <laughs> I'm in a uncanny mood. Good night. Night, lovely. Take care. Do you mind, Governor? Letting a lady pass. <laughs> well, now, Governor, it ain't quite proper, you know. Seeing as how we ain't what you might call acquainted. <laughs> Inspector Collins. Uh, yes, Jenkins? There's been another one, sir. Yes? A woman again. Yes? Found this morning in an alley in Stepney. Mutilated. Yes. And naturally, a message for you, sir. Uh, but that is, for all of us here. Naturally, a message for Scotland Yard. Attached to the poor girl. Here it is, sir. Read it, Jenkins. Yes, sir. An observation for the infallible bloodhounds of Scotland Yard. I trust only one thing in a woman, that she will not come to life again after she is dead. In all other things, I distrust her. This, my friends, is the unalterable conviction of Jack the Ripper. Oh, it was ghastly, sir. Of course, they've all been ghastly. He meant them to be. And now all London will quake again, and to conceal its terror will make us out to be the fools. Jenkins. Yes, sir? Call in Marston, Carney, and Williams. Subject, Jack the Ripper. Oh, hello, 
Hello, Mrs. Archer. Rather late for a young woman to be out alone these days. Late? He comes out of his hiding place when the sun goes down. Oh, whatever are you talking about? The Ripper. Oh. I'm surprised that Mr. Lee's even permits you to leave your room under the circumstances. Well, our quarters are small, Mrs. Archer, and Mr. Lee's work is important. I often go out of an afternoon to give him the privacy he requires. Your husband is a story writer, ain't he? He's a novelist. I should like to read some of his novels sometime. Sometime. Good evening, Mrs. Archer. Good evening, Mrs. Lees. Oh, Robert. Oh, Robert, I'm... Oh, oh poor no. Robert. You've oh, worked no. so hard. Someday. Oh, oh, well. Please, don't let him do it. Why, Robert? No. No, he's killing her. What is it, Robert? Can't you see he's killing her in cold blood? Robert! Robert, wake up! Oh, please, don't! Don't! Robert! Oh, Lord! Robert, wake up! You're dreaming! And, uh, uh, what? Oh. Oh, it's you, Martha. Oh, darling. You oh. are having a terrible nightmare. You've been waking to... Nightmare? No, Martha. That was no nightmare. I saw it. I saw every bit of it as clearly as I see you. Robert! It was outside a pub in Soho. I could see the sign. The Falstaff. She turned the corner down a dark street and there he was. Robert, my I dear. even could see the clock on the wall at the Falstaff. It was exactly 11.10 tonight. But it isn't six yet, Robert. It isn't six? Then, then it hasn't happened yet. What hasn't happened? Martha, you must stay here. I'm going out. Lock the door and draw the blinds. Why, dear? I want you... I want you to stay in this room until I return. Do you hear me? But, Robert, what is it? Please tell me, what is it? He's going to kill again tonight. I saw it in this awful dream I just had. Oh, my darling. I don't know who she is, but he is Jack the Ripper. Inspector Collins, you think all I've been telling you is nothing but nonsense. And I'd be the first to share your skepticism, except for one thing. I saw it. You mean in this dream of yours? Well, yes. Of course. Is this kind of thing habitual with you, Mr. Lees? No, I rarely dream. I, I don't know what you'd call this. A vision? A kind of clairvoyance? Because it was as real as anything I've ever seen. And that is why I'm so certain, so absolutely certain, that this monster will strike again tonight. Why, I can show you on this map where I saw it happen, where it will happen. Here, the Falstaff, on the corner at Trenton. The girl was dressed in black. She was walking slowly up the dark, narrow alley next to the chemist's. Here, and he... Inspector, you must believe me. Uh, Jenkins. Begging your pardon, sir. I'd call it an old wives' tale. Gentlemen, whether you believe it me or not, nothing would be lost if you'd send out men. Mr. Lees, it may interest you to know that 4,500 men are patrolling the streets of London to prevent what you have just so vividly described. And they'd like nothing better than to have the Ripper try one of his tricks. You don't believe me, do you? It's been quite interesting, Mr. Lees. Thank you for taking the trouble to come here to tell us about your... Uh, experience. I see. Well, good evening, gentlemen. <laughs> Another one. What? Another crackpot. Dreams, rumors, suspicions. If we listened to all of them, there'd be no time left to do our job. Jenkins, the ways of truth are as devious as they are of many. But in our profession, it's safer to rely on 4,500 men than on a nightmare. Williams, over here. Oh, what is it, Connie? What's it? Oh, law, what a mess. Ah, uh, that were a pretty lass once. Well, it's pretty hard to tell. No. How did you find her? A funny thing, Constable. I was up this early not more than a half hour ago. And just now, after I left the false staff, mm -hmm. uh, not that I drink on duty, just looking around, you know. I was coming back this way. I heard footsteps running, so I started after him. 
I'd have caught the bloke, too, if I hadn't almost broke me neck when I stumbled over this. Say, there's a ticket on her. What? Here, look. <laughs> Pinned onto her like a bloomin' mail check. Here, let me see. Hmm. Listen to this, Williams. All wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. Remember this if you will judge Jack the Ripper. This is the place, Inspector. Uh, very good, Jenkins. What do you make of that, sir? Rather late for nobody to be at home. Perhaps the... I was just beginning to worry, dear. Oh, I thought it was... Who are you? Oh, I, I beg your pardon, madam. Uh, you are Mrs. Lees? Yes. Has something happened to Robert? Isn't Mr. Lees at home? I know, he... Uh, what business is it of yours at this hour? Scotland Yard, ma'am. Oh, something has happened to Robert. What? Tell me, please. Uh, may we come in, Mrs. Lees? Oh, yes, of course. Whatever it is, I can stand it. Just tell me. So far as we know, Mrs. Lees, nothing has happened to your husband. We simply came to have a little chat with him. Perhaps you can help us. Me? What about? How long has your husband been gone from here? Well, I... I don't quite know. What time is it? Past midnight. Odd hour to be out, Mum. If that's where he is. Oh, he's out. After dinner, he started to work on his book. He's a novelist, you know. But he said the words wouldn't come. Mm -hmm. he, he was so upset, so he went out for a stroll. I've been expecting him. I, I must have fallen asleep. Had no idea it was so late. Oh, Inspector, uh, please... Mrs. Lees, have you any idea why your husband was upset? Only that... Oh, but you gentlemen must know. So? But didn't he go to see you early this evening? He told you he was going to see me? Oh, yes, of course. He had a dream, a strange dream. He said that... Yes, I know. Then he did see you? Yes. But then I don't understand. Where is he? Why have you come here at this hour? Because, Mrs. Lees, your husband's dream came true. Nothing comes alive. It's it's all as dead as... Dead as... Oh, I don't know. Robert, you're not being fair to yourself. Perhaps if you forgot your book for a while, it'll come naturally. Why don't you take a walk? Oh. You usually walk when you're feeling this way about your work. For three days now, you haven't even left this room. All right, I haven't. I'm sorry. I was only trying to help. I know, I know. It's just that I... Well, I guess I'm a bit distraught. Martha, I haven't gone out because... Well, I have a feeling that everywhere I go, I'm being watched. Yes, Robert? Everywhere I go, I see strange faces. They're always the same faces, faces of men I don't know. Beginning to haunt me. Robert... Perhaps it's some kind of hallucination. Sometimes I think I'm going out of my mind. No, Robert. I'm afraid it's all very real. I should have told you. What, dear? Two gentlemen from Scotland Yard came to see you the other night. Scotland Yard? Why didn't they wait if they wanted to see me? It was the night the girl was murdered. Told them it would happen. They came at midnight. You weren't here. They stole only a short time, but... You didn't come home until dawn. I was out walking. You knew that. Yes, Robert. Why didn't you tell me about this visit? Because... I knew you were agitated, and I, I didn't want to upset you any further. Why should that upset me? You say they came at midnight? Yes. After the murder. It was too late. I knew they didn't believe me. Oh, yes, they listened politely, found it very interesting, and then dismissed me with the utmost courtesy. But they were too late. And now they have the audacity to put a watch on me. As though I were the murderer. Robert, don't say that. What's the matter, Martha? 
Martha, look at me. Martha, you don't think I... Robert! Please, Robert! What can I do for you, sir? A small package of Virginia Cavendish, please. Right, sir. Oh, I, I have some fine new pipes, sir, if you're interested. And turn, richly grained, imported briar, of course. Just the tobacco, please. Yes, sir. That'll be one and six, sir. Here you are. Uh, I beg your pardon, but look, please. Is there a man with a bloated face and grey hair loitering near your door? Well, I'll see, sir. Why, so there is, sir. Someone you're trying to avoid, I take it? I haven't tried yet. But I'm getting rather sick of that face. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. See here. This has got to stop. I beg your pardon? I'm a reasonable man, but my patience is wearing thin. Well, there must be some mistake. I'm guilty of no violation of any law, and I stand upon my rights as a subject of Her Majesty to be free of such nuisance. Oh, really? I, I haven't the foggiest notion of how this concerns me. You've been hounding me ever since I stepped out of my house. Out of tosh. Well, well perhaps this is tosh too. Oh. Well, had no idea it would be that easy. At least I won't be hounded this afternoon. Begging your pardon, Governor. Would you let me pass? Well, really, now, I must say... What do you think you... Oh, no! Oh, Lord. No. Oh, no. Martha! Martha! Robert, you're so pale. What's happened? He's done it again. He's done it again, Martha. Robert, are you all right? This time I wasn't asleep. I was just walking along the street. But I saw it as clearly as though I'd been there. Saw what, Robert? The murder. Oh. It was him again. Jack the Ripper. And a woman. It... Oh, Martha, it was horrible. Robert. Robert, please, you're overwrought. Please, darling, lie down and rest and maybe no. then you'll... No, I must try again. I must tell them. This time they'll have to believe me. Go on, Mr. Lees. Then, then when he accosted her in the street, he, he plunged a sharp instrument, some kind of knife, into her heart. Then he withdrew it. And then, oh, it was so horrible. And yet he did it almost nicely. He removed her left ear. Why would he do that? He always seems to have a reason, Mr. Lees. Then you believe me. By an unhappy coincidence, I received a message from the uh, Ripper which reveals his reason. Perhaps you wish to hear it. Listen. The wise pretend to make it clear tis no great loss to lose an ear. Why are we then so fond of two when by experience one would do? Why, that's by Jonathan Swift. I recognize the quotation too, Mr. Lees. Then don't you see? I was right. It was true. Was? Oh, I don't know. I, I didn't see the time. I, I couldn't tell. It wasn't like the other one. It just happened. Yes, yes, it happened, Mr. Lees. Half an hour ago, a woman was murdered, and her left ear was detached. Oh. Then I'm too late. We were all too late. Mr. Lees, where were you this afternoon? I... Why, I was out walking. Yes, you went walking. You bought some tobacco at Plummet's. Then shortly after, in a tantrum, you belabored one of our men. I lost my temper. I resent being watched. I can understand that, Mr. Lees. On the other hand, it was unfortunate for you. Because now we have no idea where you were or what you did after you lost your temper. Is 
That Mrs. Lee's again, Inspector. She's been here every day since we took her husband in. Naturally, she wants to see him. I think it might be arranged. Mm, that she wants to see you, too. I told her it's impossible. Oh, a rash statement, Jenkins. I should very much like to see Mrs. Lee's alone. Uh, bring her in, please. Yes, sir. Mrs. Lee's? Yes. The inspector will see you. How do you do, Mrs. Lee's? Why are you holding my husband, Inspector Collins? Unhappily, on a very grave charge. But what has he done? He's only been trying to help you. There are often odd reasons for trying to help. Oh, surely you don't think Robert could have anything to do with all these horrible crimes? I don't know, Mrs. Lees. Then you have no reason for keeping him. I don't know any more than you do, Mrs. Lees. All I know is that twice he has come to me with an incredibly accurate description of a murder. In neither instance have we been able to account for his own activities during the time the crimes were committed. Of course, this may be purely circumstantial, but Mrs. Lees, he has been confined here for more than two weeks now, and there have been no more of these murders. But you admit, Inspector, that you have no proof. You're simply penalizing Robert for trying to help you. I'm merely trying to protect the women of London. If Mr. Lees really can help me, his presence close at hand and under guard should be no deterrent. Oh, I don't know. I'm so confused. I don't understand. Mrs. Lees, there is much that is hard to understand. God! Warden! Can you hear me? Yeah, man, we can't have no commotion here. I insist upon seeing Inspector Collins. Now then, take it easy. You're not at the Savoy, you know. I demand that you take me to him at once. Demand all you like, only let's have a little quiet, if you don't mind. Listen to me, please. I have vital information for him. Now, ain't that interesting. Take me to him, I demand. Well, Mr. Lees, so you finally decided to talk. Mr. Jenkins, please, I beg of you, I must see the Inspector. Some more of your dreams, Mr. Lees? Yes, but it's not really a dream this time. I mean... Just what do you mean, Mr. Lees? I've seen him. I know what he looks like. I can lead you to him. I can lead you to Jack the Ripper. I don't know what it is, Inspector, but I could see him. I could even see what he was wearing. He was in dark tweeds, a grey slouch hat. In this fantastic vision of yours. Mr. Lees, I would prefer even the flimsiest kind of fact. You must let me find him for you, Inspector. You have nothing to lose. Nothing except perhaps confidence in myself. And in what people are pleased to call the rational order of things. But, Inspector... After all, what if you prove to be right? What then? You rid London of a monster. Mr. Lees, I'll be candid. I don't know about you. You may be the murderer. If you are innocent, it still doesn't explain your, shall we say, experiences. I can't explain them myself. In my profession, we must rule such things out of our reasoning. On the other hand, we must never reject any possibility, however remote. Then you let me try? Yes. Yes, I'll go with you myself. But let me make myself clear. I do not believe in dreams, visions, or clairvoyance. The burden of proof is on you. <laughs> If you'll pardon me for saying so, Inspector, this is nothing but a wild goose chase. We're not chasing a wild goose, Jenkins. But, uh, Mr. Lees, Jenkins has a point. Sir? We've been walking with you up and down and around London for over three hours. I know, Inspector, but if you'll have patience. When I was in the cell, it was all so clear. I could see his house, inside and outside. <laughs> Too bad you didn't think to look for a number on it. Go on, Mr. Lees. I'm sure I'll recognize it when I see it, and I'll know him. Give me a little more time, please. Mm. 
Another half hour inspection, it'll be daylight. All right, Jenkins. If anybody were to find out what we've been up to, we'd be the laughing stock of London. Clairvoyant dreams. London isn't thinking too kindly of us as it is. Yes, but what are we doing wandering about the West End? The kind of scoundrel we're looking for wouldn't be out here. Our man may not recognize boundary lines after all. Hey, Lees, what is it? Yes, what's the matter with you, Lees? Lees? Yes. Yes. That's it. That house. That's where he lives. That house? Oh, no, really, Inspector, this is a bit thick. Do you know who lives there? Yes, of course. Dr. Brandt. <sighs> a fine Mary Chasey's let us, sir. Do you know Dr. Brandt, Mr. Lees? No, sir. Well, you I... ought to. He's one of the greatest surgeons in all of England. I don't know. But Jack the Ripper lives in that house. Rot! Inspector, let's get back to headquarters. No, please, you've got to believe me. We've had enough of your nonsense. If I had my way, I'd take you... Jack the Ripper lives in that house. And I tell you, that's impossible. It was impossible for me to foretell the murder of the woman in black. But I did. The woman whose ear was taken off. I told you of that. Please. Uh, wait, Jenkins. I hate to disturb Dr. Brandt at this hour, but as I said, Mr. Lees, the burden of proof is on you. Come along. I wouldn't blame him if he threw us out on the street for such cheek. Yes? What is it? Is Dr. Brandt in? I'm Mrs. Brandt. What can I do for you, gentlemen? I'm Inspector Collins, Scotland Yard. I should like to speak with Dr. Brandt. It's very important or I wouldn't disturb him at this hour. I'm sorry, Inspector. The doctor went out in a desperate case about midnight. He hasn't yet returned. Oh, my apologies, Mrs. Brandt. Uh, I shall see him later in the day. No. Oh, no. What's the matter with you, Lise? Oh, no. Eh? No. Why, that man is sick. Bring him inside here. Well, no. Uh... No, we must stop him before it's too late. Please! Inspector, he's trying to make a break for it. Come on! I say, mister, can't you please tell me the way to Hanky Park? It's early, I know, but I have a very important engagement. Strictly business, you know. Hold on, Governor. I was just asking directions. You're crazy, mister. Get the private six stop. They're going. Oh, yeah, here you go. Drop that knife, you fiend. Get away. The me. Inspector, hey, he's killing a man. Don't call an answer. Stop him. him. Help me, Inspector. He's gone out of his head. Let me go, you fool. This is the man Let you want. Go, Jenkins. You have the wrong one. What? I've got him. Yeah. There. Jenkins, take care of that woman. Well, uh, yes, sir, but... All right, now. Up on your feet. She's all right, Inspector. We're in time. In, in time? Well, Dr. Brandt? Dr. Brandt? In time. But you were so long in coming. Thank God you're here at last. Inspector. Look, Inspector. The same dark tweeds. The grey slouch hat. Arrest him. He's the man you want. This man is Jack the Ripper. Yes. Take me away. Confine me where I can no longer commit these horrible crimes for which there is no pardon in heaven or earth. Inspector. Protect me from this accursed madness that comes over me. This uncontrollable urge to kill that twists my mind each night into that of a raving maniac. I... Each time, I knew it was coming on. And I prayed. I prayed with all my heart that you, that that someone would come, would stop me. You see, I could not stop myself. Now, here again is our producer-director, Jack Johnstone. What about Robert Lees and his visions? Are there really such powers... Do people foresee events in such detail and with such extreme clarity? And if they do, by what extraordinary faculty? What do you think? Is it natural or... Supernatural. Who knows?
Tonight's story was dramatized by Milton Merlin, with music composed and conducted by Felix Mills. The entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. This dramatization was based on case records, but for obvious reasons, actual names were not used. Larry Chatterton speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. we can't ignore our wives, can we? No, but I have no respect for a man who doesn't try. <laughs> From comedy to sci-fi. Adventures in time and space. Told in future tense. You're listening to Old Time Radio USA. Now let's get back to where we were, which is about as boring a place as I can think of. <laughs> Tell us again, Daddy. Tell us again. Oh, no, not again. Please, Daddy, how tall are you? Tell us how tall. Uh, I'm 20 foot 5 in my stocking feet. How big are your shoes? What size do you wear? Size 902 in a triple Z. That's our Daddy, the big guy. <laughs> NBC presents The Big Guy, another in the series of adventures of a very unusual detective, Joshua Sharp. Joshua Sharp works for his clients on a strictly cash basis to provide for the needs of his nearest and dearest, Josh Jr. and his daughter Debbie. To these two, Sharp is both father and mother. To his clients, he is a good detective. To Josh and Debbie, he's the friendly magician, the fabulous hero, the giant among giants, the big guy. Tonight's adventure with the big guy, the case of the villainous friend. A man alone, trying to bring up a pair of youngsters, runs into a lot of unexpected problems. One of my most unexpected was a sudden shortage of bedtime stories. After all, you can read Grimm's fairy tales only a few hundred times before the kids begin to tire of them. And that goes for Hans Christian Andersen and all the rest of the Once Upon a Timers. Now, I'd reached that point with Josh and Debbie, and they were getting so bored with witches and sleeping beauties that finally, for all our sakes, I tried tapping a new source. I bought a copy of Tales from Shakespeare. It was an immediate hit. In fact, it was too big a hit. That first night, I read The Tempest and Two Gentlemen from Verona, and still they didn't want me to stop. What's the next one, Daddy? Well, we'll let the next one wait, baby. You, you and Debbie have to go to sleep. But what's the name of it? Just the name of it? Uh, it's, uh, uh... It's the tragedy of Othello. Now you just close your eyes and... Oh, what about him, Daddy? Yes, Daddy, who was he? Well, he was a man, Josh. Oh, and what was the tragedy? Well, he was married to a woman named Desdemona who loved him very much. Is that a tragedy? No, the tragedy came about because he had a friend, a friend named Diago. Yes? And Diago came to Othello and told him that Desdemona didn't love him at all. He said she loved somebody else. He was bad, wasn't he, Daddy? Oh, very. And what happens next? Well, next he... Ah. Next, a couple of shrewd articles who are trying to worm another story out of their hard-working father give him a kiss and say good night. And it was a good night under my roof. But elsewhere, things were happening that were fated finally to intrude on my routine and make a shambles of it. The center of these events was a boy, a boy named Frank Gollard, I'd snagged the lad in question two years ago, after he'd assisted in the armed robbery of a filling station and committed assault and battery resisting arrest. My action in the matter came as part of my contract with the Mutual Indemnity Insurance Company, and I had been in the courtroom the day the judge passed a ten-year sentence on Frank Gollard. And then, the same evening, while I was telling Josh and Debbie about Othello, inside the drab gray walls of the upstate penitentiary...
to number five, six, or four. Separate the cell block A. Number five, six, or five to number six, or five, nine. Separate the cell block B. You hit from your wife lately, Frank. Yeah, I got a letter from Lila last week. Well, let's turn in half. What do you say? Yeah, sure, kid. In a minute. Lila. Oh, that's, that's a pretty name. Hap? Huh? How come you ask me that? Oh, I uh, heard you tossing around last night. I knew you wasn't sleeping. And I've been thinking about all the guys in this place who got somebody waiting for them and wondering where all them somebodies are tonight. <laughs> wondering who she's dancing with and wondering who she's drinking with. Wonder who's a kissing? Shut up. Oh, kid. I told you once, Hap. I was only wondering. She's a clean kid. Clean and sweet and straight. Oh, sure, sure. There's a few good wrens in the world. Maybe you got yourself one of them. But you couldn't expect me to guess that now, could you, Frank? Man never knows about a thing like that. Man just never knows. Good night, Hap. You ain't sore on me, are you, Frank? I said good night. I don't want you to be sore on me, you hear? You hear me, Frank? Okay, I'm not sore about you. Okay, Hap. Good night, baby. Hap was his cellmate, and Hap was his friend. Big, slow, paternal Hap McLean. In for life. And not a man to talk much about the way he was to spend the rest of his natural days. It was mutual friendship, and the two found a degree of peace in each other's companionship. It was a peace, however, that was ripped to shreds with the suddenness of a thunderclap one hot night in early August. Hap had smuggled a newspaper from the prison library into the cell, and young Gollard was lying on his bunk, turning the pages. Hey, Hap! Uh, what's the matter? What's eating you, Frank? Hey, listen to this. What cute lovely whose maid is doing a ten-year stretch for armed robbery is now seeing the town inside out with more than one slick-haired Romeo? Even while I was on trial, she was rocking no, me. Oh, no, kid, take it. She was, she was. While I took the ride to this pile of stinking stone. While I prayed for every night, she was selling me out. Midnight to morning, night after night, all the way down the line. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Listen to me, will you, Frank? Listen to half an ease off, baby. But he had no choice about taking it. With his friend Hap's help, he calmed down and went on with the monotonous routine of his daily life behind the walls of the prison. And then, late one night, weeks later, in the cell he shared with Hap McLean, he found that he didn't have to take it anymore. Frank, hey kid, wake up and listen. Uh, listen, uh, old Hap, and listen good. You gotta get out of here. What's that? You're eating yourself alive. You gotta move loose from this place. Oh, but I can't. I can't. I'm not up for parole Forget for Forget three... the parole, baby. Hap's got it all fixed fine. You got it fixed? Yeah. Take a look, kid. Where'd you get the gun? Out of the arsenal, baby. It took me three months and a lot of doing, but I got it. And the trustee, the one in the laundry office, he's going to leave the laundry door unlocked for 20 minutes tomorrow night. There'll be a truck just outside. How'd you do this, Hap? Oh, look, I've been in this can 12 years. There are ways, baby. There are always ways. You come with me? No, no. I got nothing with the outside world, kid. Hap will rest easy right here. You go on out. You can still hate. And that means you can still live. Enjoy yourself. And don't get yourself snagged, baby. It was at 11 o'clock the next night that the guard changed. Two minutes before this chosen hour, Hap McLean stood crucial guard for the appearance of any official. And the boy prepared for his venture. Well, you make for her apartment. You figure Lila will show? I'll wait till she does. What? And get nabbed off waiting? Forget it. Now, look, 
I'll get the grapevine and let her know that you're coming and tell her to stand by for you. Now. There it is. Eleven o'clock, kid. Okay. Play it cagey now, baby. Hap won't be around. Look out for you. There's no point in saying thank you, Hap. Go on, you punk. I'll brain you. The boy was halfway across the prison yard when... Stop! Stop where you are! And the shaft of a giant searchlight struck him like the lunge of an angry lion. Darting out of its glare, he took cover behind an angle of the wall. Come out in the open! Come out with your hands up! The boy fired at the guard on the watchtower. Oh! He made a dash for the laundry building and found the door unlocked as scheduled. the back roads on the all-night drive to the city while the state was springing into action to retake Frank Gollard. Retake him, dead or alive. Next morning, when I walked into my place of business, my own personal private eye, Risky Skinner, was waiting for me as usual. But today, Risky wasn't alone. A young city cop, Tom Saunders by name, had dropped in to tell me about the Gollard escape. He was little more than a rookie, this cop. Green, but enterprising. So, uh, knowing you were the man who put the finger on him in the first place two years ago, Sharp, it occurred to a few of the boys at Precinct Headquarters that you might have ideas about retaking Frank Gollard. They figure you dig up a few angles about the punk that could be maybe useful, Commander. Well, I'll be glad to do all I can. Uh, tell me, how much action is underway now? Well, the uh, state's being dragged from end to end. Even the Coast Guard's been alerted on this one. Any results yet? <laughs> so far, we've drawn a goose egg. Uh, just a second. Yeah. Sharp speaking. Uh, this is uh, Lila Goddard, Mr. Sharp. What? Frank Gollard's wife. Where are you? I'm not calling from home, Mr. Sharp. I'm afraid to go there. Why? I'll tell you why. I got a call last night from the grapevine at Goldville Prison. Yeah? Frank is on his way to my place. On the way to his own home? Hello. Hello, Mrs. Gollard. Mrs. Gollard! Hello! Hello! The wire was dead, but the news had been sensational. Leaving Risky to try to check back on the call, I found Mrs. Gollard's address in the city listings, latched onto Patrolman Saunders, and headed for Gollard's home. By 25 of 10, we were in his apartment. I was at the window, and Saunders by the door. Hey, Sharp. Okay, okay, I see him. He's coming in. Great. Get ready for business. Oh, let's uh, wait for him in the hall. Huh? All right. Easy with that door, Saunders. Yes. Here he comes. Well, let him get to the first landing. And for Pete's sake, stop shaking. There he is. He's carrying a gun. Hey, Saunders. No, wait. <laughs> But I was too late. The green rookie, firing in panic, missed. And Frank Gollard went crashing back down the stairs, through the door, and out into the street. I didn't have to be told that once loose, Gollard would head for his wife. After all, Lila had tipped me off, and he probably knew that she was the only person on Earth who had been wise to his whereabouts. The immediate deal, therefore, was to contact her without delay. It was just about this time there came a knock on the door of Warden Jameson's office at the state penitentiary, and a cell block guard by the name of Spears walked in with the announcement that somebody wanted to talk to the warden. Who is it, Spears? It's prisoner from cell block A. He yammered till I went to see what was wrong. Yes, yeah, Spears. Well, then he told me he could retake Gollard for us, nothing flat. And I can, Warden. Honest, so help me now. I'm not kidding. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I told about. you to wait outside. All right, Spears. To... All right, I'll talk to him. Okay, Warden. You say you can recapture Frank Gollard? And be back before morning. Who are you? Number 5,200. I mean your name. Oh, my na uh, name is uh, ha Hap McLean. I presume, McLean, that you can only perform this remarkable feat if you allow 
to be left out of the prison alone. Who wants alone? Send Spears with me with a gun, a dozen guns. Who cares? Now, look, I'm only trying to do the right thing here, Mr. Warden. That's all I'm interested I in. I see. All right. We'll send Spears with you. And you won't regret it, I'll tell you what. And I'm telling you something, McLean. If you succeed in this mission, I'll see what can be done to secure you a full and complete pardon. No, you mean it. Don't you think you deserve it? Well, I guess I did figure something like that. Huh? Yeah, I imagined you did, McLean. Spears. Yes, sir. You'll take McLean into the city and let him do exactly as he thinks best. <laughs> So, Hap McLean, informer and temporary public hero, passed out of the prison walls on his errand of black treachery. Meanwhile, we were still ransacking the city for Lila, and as it turned out, Frank Gollard was doing the same. In the phone booth of a hole-in-the-wall cigar store on a side street... Uh, she must be in a summer cottage at Riverview. Yeah, that's it. That's probably where she's hiding out. Uh, give me Riverview 534. Riverview 534. Thank you, sir. Hello? Is this you, Lila? Oh, Frank. How are you, Frank, honey? I'm fine. What's happening, Frank? I'm looking for you, Lila. Oh, honey, I just turned on the radio and heard the, the news. I just woke up. I'd been asleep. Why did you go up to Riverview to sleep, Lila? Matter? Nothing. I just wanted to see you. Where are you? I'll come right into the city. Uh, stay where you are. I'll come to you. All right, sweetheart. You remember how to get here? Yeah, I remember. You were uh, alone, Lila? Yes. A girlfriend was staying with me up until last night, but she had to get back to town. Oh, honey, I wish we could be together. I wish we never had to leave here. Stay where you are till I get there, baby. Maybe you never will. Feeling for the gun butt in his pocket, Frank Gollard ducked out onto the sidewalk and started the torturous journey toward his final long-sought vengeance. Later in the afternoon, back at the office, Saunders and I were checking the short wave reports. You know, it, it baffles me a little, Sharp. And what does? Gollard's wife turning him in. Why? She's a gunman's doll, isn't she? Uh, no, 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 not quite. Anyway, she's not running true to form. Why not? A word around has been that she's almost arranged for his parole. Strange, huh? Yeah, very. Commander. Yeah, Risky? Well, a little luck at last. Well, that we can use. <laughs> I think I found out where Mrs. Gollett phoned you from. Yeah? But well, I'm afraid it won't help any. It seems she rang up from a phone booth. Phone booth, huh? Where? In a place called Banner's Tavern over on Tyne Street, near the river. You know it? I said, do you know it, Commander? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know it. Risky. Yeah, Commander? Go get me a cap and a sweater. Huh? A cap and a sweater. What do you want them for? To wear. I'm going to Banner's Tavern, Risky, and I want to look like one of the boys. <laughs> Banner's Tavern at the foot of a wharf on the river had never been what might be called a pride to the community, and tonight was no exception. The clientele I saw at once was entirely male, except for one blonde cutie who sat alone over a glass of beer, a bright red scar of a smile on her hard face. Well, what are you looking at? Well, what do you think, honey? Beat it. I got a boyfriend coming. Yeah? From where? That would be telling. Well, uh, how's about a little drink till he shows? Well, I'll... Uh, go ahead. What do you have? How about a gin and water? Why not? What's your name, beautiful? Esther. That's all? Esther Moody. Moody? Mm -hmm. Esther Moody? Well, you ain't the doll used to kick around with half McLean. You know her? Like that. We used to operate together in North Jersey. <laughs> well, what do you know? How's he doing these days? He's in stir. Didn't you know that? For how long? 
Hard to say right now. Some kind of caper in the works. Yeah? I've been trying to figure it out all night. What's the lowdown? Well, uh, lean over here. Yeah. About 11 o'clock last night, Hap sent me the word over the grapevine. Uh Uh-huh. And he tells me to call up a certain private eye this morning, announce myself as Mrs. Gullard, and say that Frank is on his way to his wife's flat. What do you think? Uh, What do you think? I think I trusted you mighty fast, handsome. How about that little drink? Uh, How about better? Better? How about a little pinch? What? Rouse stuff, lady. I'm the mean? private eye you handed that runner on to this morning. I got her to headquarters. Not, however, without a set of fingernail marks down my cheek. And walked in on a bit of exciting news. It seemed a postal clerk at a place called Riverview had phoned in giving Lila Gollard's whereabouts. The address, 21 Canton Lane, at which street number Frank Gollard had just arrived. Oh, Frank, Frank. He sounded so strange over the phone. I I, I don't understand. What have I done? You really want me to tell you, Lila? You called the cops and told them where they could pick me up. I did, Frank? Yeah, you. Frank. Frank, how could I? I didn't even know you'd broken out. McLean got word to you at the apartment last night and told you where I'd be. But I wasn't there. I wasn't even there. Ah, oh, that's an easy out. You turn me in and then you run for the tall timber. Frank. Frank, do you honestly believe I'd do that? I know you did it, you hypocritical swank. Oh, oh, darling. Oh, darling. <laughs> yeah. Hello, kid. Hey. Myself, kid, I figured you needed somebody to look after you. You done business yet? Yeah, not all of it. But I'm right here at home base. Yeah, so I figured. Hap? Yeah, baby. You contacted my wife last night, didn't you? Well, sure. Sure thing. Why do you ask? I won't ask again. I gotta hang up now. Well, just a second, Frank. Uh, look, uh, I'm in the alley behind Banner's Tavern on the side by the river. You know where that is? Yeah, sure. And beat it down to see me as soon as you can. I got a pal along who's going to see you safe out of the States on a strictly credit basis. Okay? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a million. I'll see you, pal. You cheap, lying, rotten, deceitful tramp. Oh, no. No, Frank, no. Not a gun. Shut up. This is beyond begging and no place for talk. If you've got prayers to say, say them. There won't be any time later. I won't need time for prayers, Frank. I'd die before I hurt you. I don't mind losing my life, Frank. All I regret is I'll never see you again. Never. Never. It was at that moment that Risky and I drove up in front of 21 Canton Lane and heard the shots as we ran up the path to the house. That was it, Commander? Yeah. Gullard. Gullard, you blasted fool. What did you do, you crazy punk? I just killed a liar, a stoolie, and a cheat. Let's go now without questions, huh? First, there's got to be a few answers given, boy. Such as? Such as? Did you know this cheat here had just about arranged to get you paroled at the next meeting of the board? You're lying. Too bad for your peace of mind, I'm not. Not when I said that, nor when I say this. Your wife didn't call me and inform on you today, Gollard. She did, she did. No, she didn't. The call I got came from a woman named Esther Moody, who made it to help weave this net you're caught in. Moody? Esther Moody? Who's that? What's she got to do with me? She's got nothing to do with you. But I think maybe her boyfriend has. A boyfriend? A guy by the name of Hap McLean. For a moment, he stared at me like a wounded animal, and then his eyes closed slowly. He shook his head wearily, as if to come out of a sick dizziness, and neither Risky nor I caught the movement of his hand as he blasted the globe dangling from the ceiling, plunging plunging us into blind blackness as he crashed out through the window. Nearer 
after dawn in the alley behind Banner's Tavern. It's getting chilly waiting here, McLean. Where's your boy? Easy, Spears. Take it easy. He's on his way to us. Yeah. There he comes. You sure it's him? Can't you see, Flathead? Hey, give me a gun. Let me take him in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Now, duck behind the lamppost so we don't see you too soon. Huh? Here I am, kid. How you making it, huh? I killed her, huh? Yeah, sure, sure. That's what you had to do. Come on. We'll go in banners and have a few snorts. That'll set you up right, huh? Eh? Hey, Hap. Yeah. Where's the pal who was going to help me lamb out of the States? Oh, uh, well, he had to go, Frank. He'll be back. I figured he was back now. That's him behind the lamppost, ain't it, Hap? I got to get him, too. Kid. Help me, kid. How help much me. blood do you want on your hands, baby? Just a little more. Just a little more, you greasy, crummy stool pigeon. Pat McLean took a look into the empty, cold eyes of the boy and suddenly bolted down the alley. At the corner, McLean swung abruptly and fired. The bullet hit, and he waited for Frank Goller to go down, but he waited in vain. The boy came toward him, head lowered, staggering. Baby, baby, don't be sore on me. I don't want you sore on me, Frank. As he spoke, McLean fired again and found himself with an empty gun in his hand. And he blinked unbelievingly as the boy swayed with the anguish of the shots. And then steadily, he plowed forward. Half crazy with fear, McLean stumbled into the darkness until he came to World's End, the edge of the wharf behind the tavern. Oh, baby, oh, Frank, you gotta listen to your hat. You gotta listen to your happy. You can't be sore on me, baby. I'm for you, honest. Oh, don't shoot, kid. Let's talk it out there. Frank Gollard, looking like a child asleep, was dead, stretched out on the rotten planking of the wharf when we found him. Josh and Debbie were in bed when I climbed the stairs to our flat, and knowing nothing of what was going on inside of me, they clamored for the next story in the book. The next story was Othello. And as I read the tale of the tragic deaths of Desdemona and Othello and the final undoing of Iago, I shuddered with a kind of recognition. At the end of the narrative, there was silence. Then... And Othello killed himself, too? Yes, baby. Gee, I don't see why he had to die. He didn't know what he was doing. It was all Iago's fault, wasn't it, Daddy? Yes, yes, essentially it was Iago's fault. Then, then why didn't he just explain and go on living? Maybe he didn't want to, honey. Oh, you mean because he'd lost Desdemona? Is that it? Well, that's part of it. Well, what's the other part, Daddy? Don't you know? You mean he'd lost Iago, too? Yes, baby. You get the point. He'd also lost his friend. Joshua Sharp, detective, works for his clients on a strictly cash basis to provide for the needs of his nearest and dearest, Josh Jr. and Debbie. To them, he's the friendly magician, the fabulous hero, the giant among giants, the big guy. NBC has presented another in a series of adventures of The Big Guy, played by Henry Calvin and featuring David Anderson as Josh Jr. and Joan Laser as Debbie. The script was written by Peter Barry and directed by Thomas Madigan. The music was composed and played by Jack Ward. 
Members of the cast were Jim Stevens, Meryl Lee Joles, Peggy Lobbin, Bill Zuckert, Linda Watkins, Lyle Sudrow, and Sandy Strauss as Risky Skinner. Your announcer is Peter Roberts. Three times mean good times on NBC. The American album of familiar music returns tonight over most of these NBC stations, presenting the finest in Sunday evening musical listening designed for the entire family. On Sunday, September 10th, Theater Guild on the Air will be back with more hour-long presentations from Broadway and Hollywood, featuring the most famous and talented artists of stage, screen, and radio. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Here at Old Time Radio USA, you'll hear episodes from such classic radio series like Maxwell House Coffee Time, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. Nightbeat, The Whistler, The Lone Ranger, The Falcon, The Spank, The Great Gildersleeve, The Jack Benny Program, The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. For these and many more, stay tuned Old Time Radio USA for more great classics. You can listen anywhere, on your computer or any mobile device like your smartphone or tablet. You can also listen on our official radio Roku channel from the comfort of your favorite chair. Now, if you want more information on this station, go to www.oldtimeradiousa.com right now to learn more. And thank you for listening.